should hit record, eh? That would be shitty if I did the whole friggin' thing and then forgot. <laughs> that would be pretty unfortunate. <laughs> So, all right, I think I'm almost ready here, brother. I am recording. <coughs> all right, brother, I'm almost set. Wait. All right, I got your... Uh, your Twitter page up, Preston Norris is my guest. I appreciate your time, Preston. Dude, now, so it's weird how you get hooked up with people on social media. I uh, interviewed Ashley St. Clair the other day. I think that's where you picked me up. And then next thing you know, you're DMing me, hey, get me on the show. I'm like, well, who the hell are you? And then I thought to myself, <laughs> well, who the hell are you, actually? Well, why does this guy even want to talk to you? So Preston Norris is my guest at the Gen Z Conserve with a V, ends with a V, uh, is my guest. Preston, first off, tell the listeners or anybody that might be watching uh, who you are and what you're all about. All right. So I am the Gen Z Conservative, and I basically – my platform as the Gen Z conservative is fighting for conservative values, obviously, but in a more broader aspect, going to like battle against just the fact that people hate each other so much. Like you see a lot in today's, like especially on social media, you see just how people rip into each other. These keyboard warriors just, you know, yelling at each other. Or I mean, sounds like it looks like they're yelling because they go all cast and they just they just hate each other and I, what i mainly want to do is try to open up a conversation with people and i want to just get people talking i want to get people talking to each other i want to but in a respectful way not in a i'm better like i'm better than you way or i hate you way and i hate you because uh your ideas are different from mine i just want like even if you disagree with me at the end of the day like you could Still 100% hate me, disagree with me, whatever you want. But I just like to have a conversation with people, and that's really what I'm trying to go for as far as the political platform goes. Okay, so I just want to challenge you on the hate thing there a little bit because, well, one, I think you're, I think you're open-minded from the standpoint that uh, maybe you're you're willing to um, consider another point of view. So I, I kind of fell into that that. I think we all have some degree of self-created lies, right? And it's just something mm -hmm. that we keep saying over and over and over. And I've picked up on that in our few conversations that we've had, especially when I'm on the phone with you, is your use of hate, right? So I kind of I, I went on a deep dive, a, psycho, a psychological dive, to explain why we hate each other so much. Uh, it lasted a couple of years because I was really searching this question, like, what the what's wrong with us? Like between men and women, the political left and right, heterosexual versus gay, trans. I mean, we don't have any problems with gays, it seems, these days. But the, the small minority of the trans activists, I think, have created uh, the impression on us that they are the majority. That their hate and vitriol mm -hmm. and violence actually speaks for the majority middle. And the majority middle is silent. And that includes over ninety percent of us. The the yeah, the, I would I the, would agree with that. The tail end of the distribution, if you look at a political spectrum or whatever, is where the extremists lie. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, you have a voice because of it, and so do they have a voice because of it. And they are screaming hate from the mountaintops. And I think they're starting to convince some of us, including you, maybe that might be, you know, you're a conservative, but you'd be surprised how many of your conservative beliefs actually overlap with liberal beliefs. And I'm not talking about left, leftism, yeah. because I think that's disgusting. And it's the minority, uh, the majority of the lefties are liberals, are, are not quick to say that's hate speech. And I've done this huge, this huge, uh, pendulum swing in my politics and I've come to believe that in fact there's not a lot of hate out there in fact there's a lot of love out there I do think we have a propensity 
for hate. I think it's natural. I think it comes from, you know, a millennia of evolution where we were taught to protect our tribe. So I get that. But yeah, I, I just want to throw it out there that could it be that maybe the voices you're looking at and listening to loud as they are, um, are making you feel like everyone hates each other when really it's just the extreme ends of the distribution. What are your thoughts on that? No, I I completely, I would agree with that, Ma mainly because I think people who don't, the extremists, the ones who aren't the extreme ones you know, on like social media, they're not more inclined to just like spout their opinion in the comment section or like get all fussy about it because they're not extremists. And I would say that, yeah, and it's hard to get cut. It's hard to get caught up in that because it's what you see all the time. So like, yeah, for someone like me who I spend a good amount of time looking at what people are saying on social media, people who disagree with me and they're yeah, yelling at each other, it's easy for me to go, wow, look at all this hate when really you're trying to say, oh, but they're just the, uh, they're they're the minority. I know they can look like the majority, but they're the minority. And I would agree that there's a big difference between liberalism and leftism because, yeah, liberalism. If I talk to a liberal, they're not gonna suddenly jump at me and say that's hate speech and you need to get away from me because I need to save space and all this stuff. Like, <laughs> no, like I definitely think there's a difference there. But yeah, no, I I see what you're saying. And but what I would also say is that this narrative of leftism and even though it's the minority of these people who are saying these things it's kind of taking over i would say the mainstream media of now it, it, it's taking over the politically correct system now you have to in order to be politically correct you have to adhere to everything that the left says you have to you can't say uh semi-offensive gay joke without getting ridiculed for it no. in public like you, you even... could get in huge trouble if you did anything like that or like anything minorly offensive basically that's now you're in big trouble you say that in the wrong place even though they're the minority and you you could have a big problem on your hands and we've seen that you know culture follows right now uh even uh shows like uh family guy or whatever have said you know what we're gonna back off the gay jokes now because well it's just I guess they consider it not funny anymore. Uh, I'm certainly, a f you know, a supporter of free speech. And, and when they start coming after the comedians, man, you know, you got trouble. When the court jesters start getting their their heads uh, cut off socially mm -hmm. and put on spikes for all to see, uh, you know, you look at Roseanne Barr and you look at all these, these people that, uh, you know, their lives have been ruined by the mob. And you wonder, uh, you know, how far can p political correctness swing before you know it starts to swing back and when it starts to swing back it, you know the, the pendulum swinging doesn't matter if it's political or, or what it hurts you if you're in the middle of it we get it change has unintended consequences and um you know when we when we slide left and slide right people are getting caught up in the in it but uh uh, anyways, um, I'm rambling on a little bit more here. Uh, the Gen Z conservative is Preston Norris on Twitter. It's at the Gen Z conserve, and it ends with a V. Uh, Preston, tell us a little bit, a bit about you, about you specifically, what you're up to, and how you came to be so politically active. All right. Well, when I was when I was 15, I dropped out of high school it was uh so it was the beginning of my freshman year i actually only went no not my freshman year my sophomore year i went to one only like a few hours of school and it was my first year at the official high school actually because the freshman year was still at the junior high even though it was like ninth grade okay. in high school so i was still at the junior high and so this was my first day of actually being at a high school i went to about i went to one class because I had this friend that really wanted me to go because she wanted me to stay in school because we were really close. And I went to one class and I was just like, this isn't for me. Like this, these next three years, I feel like I could be so more productive and do so much more with my life. Right. If I actually, you know, if I could get working and like, I, I, I was motivated and I wanted to get a head start with things. And I was like, am I, do I really want to sit in a classroom where I have to go to the where I have to ask to okay. go to the bathroom yeah. for three more years? Yeah. And so I dropped out and it was, it was a hard decision. And 
my my parents supported me. I had my had the intention to get the GED, so they were like, okay, you can you can drop out as long as you get the GED and you get started to you get going to work. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. I had had a job already for a few months that I was part time at, and so I dropped out. I went full time. I was just working, working. I was 15 at this point, and then I turned 16. And I made it my goal. I was like, okay, I'm getting a house by the end of the year. By the, Before I turn 17, my birthday's in January, January 24th. I was like, okay, I'm getting a house before I turn 17 because my goal, my dad has done real estate for most of my life since I've been alive. And he's he hasn't held like an actual job since I was born basically. So I've always had that sort of entrepreneurial drive, like support just like what I've seen throughout my life. So I've been like, Hey, I don't need a nine to five job for the rest of my life. I can, I can do things, you know? And so I always had that. And so I was, I was like, okay, I'm going to get the house. And I kept working and I got the GED in May because there, I had to wait a little while because of some age laws in the state, but I ended up getting it in May and I passed all of them the first try and I was kind of scared, but I did. And I just, I kept working, working, working. I worked at uh, Lucy's Pizzeria. It's it's just this uh, New York style kind of sit down pizza restaurant here in Orem, and I was working there. And eventually, my dad actually, my dad found the deal. It was with his his foster brother's fiance. He lived with his foster brother for about seven years. He was never officially adopted, but uh, they were they still remain close and talk to each other and the foster brother hit my dad up and he was like hey can you come to my fiance's house because she wants to move out so she can move in with me can you just come take a look at it and she wants to sell it she doesn't really know what she can do for it and you want to come take a look at it and he was like okay sure and at this point I had I was wanting to because I had to do the deal with my dad because I'm not 18 yet so I can't legally sign a contract and so me and my dad were going to have to go in on it together and he was excited for it. I mean, he was that he was fine with that. And he saw the house, and she was just basically talking about how she wanted to get out. Like she was just like, "I'm ready to move because I'm." He's a truck driver. He drives all around the United States. She's just like, "I just want to move out, and I want to go with him, and we'll get married, and we're gonna drive trucks around." And my dad was like, "Look, you." And she told him how much she wanted for it, and he was like, "Look, you give us the house." And we will give you. She wanted two twenty-five for it, and he said we'll give you two hundred fifty thousand once it's done because we're going to fix it up, and then we'll take the rest of the profit. And she was so excited because she was getting twenty-five grand more. She said okay, and then we were able to take it, fix it up, and now we're selling it for three hundred fifty. Nice. I think that's illegal yeah. in Canada in the real estate business. It's one commission we can't charge is anything over a certain amount we keep. So that's interesting that you guys can do that down there. Or maybe it wasn't listed, so there's not that type of – you can make a private deal and do it any way you want. So so a good background. Your parents are still together? Um, they are still together, yeah. And you're 17 years old? I'm 17 years old now, yeah. So okay. I got the I got the house about, like, Two and a half weeks before I turned 17, we officially like um, closed on it, and that was very exciting. And I guess then I and then I spent the <laughs> then I spent the next. I moved there as soon as I can. I was just working on it. I did a lot of painting. I added this new grid to the wall. We got some new carpet in there. Cleaned up the whole thing, and it was a really great experience. Learned a lot. And now, yeah, it should sell. Well, I mean, it's under contract, but it should be all said and done in about eight days which is also very exciting and i'm i'm ready to get going on the next one i mean and yeah but the more on the political side so i do that and that's very exciting stuff but about a year ago is when i became more invested politically i would say i i've always grown up with just the conservative values i would guess like just good values in general i wouldn't call them conservative like personal responsibility like you know don't have sex till you're married stuff like not that you need to be conservative to do that but it's just i know more i would say more conservatives probably live by that rule um don't have sex till you're married like just try to be a good person i my dad's always just been a conservative guy and he likes to listen to sean hannity glenn beck rush limbaugh which they're not my favorite but i i can 
I can listen to them. I remember so, when I was young, maybe about your age, I got turned on to uh, talk radio, maybe a little bit before your age. Larry King was my hero back in the day because Desert Storm was the, the first war to be broadcast all over AM radio. I used to lay in bed at night and listen to the bombing of, uh, of Desert Storm, I think it was. Is that the first Iraq war? Uh, yeah, and and he was, at that time, he claimed to be the most recognizable voice in the world because he was syndicated to so many stations. That got me rolling, and then I landed on Rush Limbaugh being a lefty uh, for so long. He kind of tweaked me all the time every time I used to listen to him, and then I headed down the dial, ended up with Jim Rome, listening to his sports takes in the jungle uh, uh, with Romy, and I just kind of stayed with it. Now... Uh, uh, that's all I listen to, but podcasts have been, uh, you know, so popular. You know, I'm just so grateful for the likes of, I don't know, mm-hmm. even a Ben Shapiro, who's, you know, an Orthodox Jew, and I don't certainly uh, agree with everything he thinks or says, especially when it comes to Palestine and the, the Middle East question. But he equally carves on his own party and his own people as much as he carves uh, well, maybe he carves more on the left because the more the left gives him more material these days. Um, but I was a lefty for so long until I started watching, and I noticed the shift in myself, and it was it's pretty painful. It still is, actually, because I'm still kind of a lefty, kind of a, a, a guy that believes a little bit of socialism is good. You know, you need a balance. Um, yeah. It, it, but and here's the other thing that occurs for me. Laws are going to fix everything. You know, you can't make a gun law that's going to stop a shooter from going in and killing a bunch of kids at a school. You can't stop people from raping and killing an underground <laughs> under, mm-hmm. underground economy and all that kind of stuff. We, we can't just pass a law and think it's, it's, it's going to work. Um, but my shift to the right has been on some really key issues. Number one, free speech. The left used to champion it. Now they call it hate speech. And you're talking about safe mm-hmm. speech, safe spaces. And I get, you know, your connection to to school uh, because every, all the professors and teachers are, are lefties. Even even the media is 85% registered Democrat in the state. So it's uh, it's been a learning experience for me. And I was just talking on our local talk show here about, you know, God bless Trump. I, again, I think he's a little bit of a buffoon and, and certainly has been <laughs> proven to be a liar. Um, but at least... You know, when he spouts off at the mouth, it doesn't become policy. When, you know, other leaders used to joke about things, next thing you know, it, it'd be in a resolution somewhere. And uh, so it's been a learning experience coming off my old belief. But, uh, you know, Shapiro, Crowder, um, you know, changed my mind on a couple issues. I used yeah. to be I used to be pro uh, death penalty. Now I'm not so sure that any man has the right to take another man's life. I've just shifted on it at all uh, a little bit. And uh you know, and then what what just gets me crazy now is that the left is constantly telling people that they can't say certain things. Uh, the protesting of conservative speakers at uh, colleges and universities, you know, assaulting mm-hmm. a guy like Michael Knowles. Was it the other day they got, you know, yeah, some liquids? Yeah, like a week ago he got thrown some liquid some sprayed on I don't him. think it was bleach, but they thought it was bleach at the time. It just like tried to drench him in it like that's crazy stuff and i can't stand for it and i think if if nothing else and i said on on my call today that you know god bless trump for for one thing everyone is looking at politics and talking about politics now and it's about time they all suffered my addiction that i've been consumed with over the the last yeah. few decades i i made a deal with myself that you know, I have enough problems controlling what little hate I have inside of me. And I, I just made a deal. I wasn't going to waste any of my hate on him. I wasn't going to create any new stuff. And so, you know, he's given the middle finger to a lot of, you know, um, not, not people, but institutions. Like, I just don't care. And I, I like that. I also can spot a a narcissist at 50 paces now, so I give Trump a little bit of credit for that because we, uh, we well, all well, fall on the spectrum somewhere. Have that. <laughs> yeah, we all fall on the spectrum somewhere. And, you know, it, it, it really, for me, has just shone a bright light of hypocrisy on all of us, but especially the left. When you get, a, you know, a superstar, or who used to be a superstar, I guess, like Madonna, standing up at the Women's March saying that she thinks of killing him every day or bombing the White House, whatever, whatever the hell yeah, she says. And then, she, and then she's unable. 
She has an, a complete inability to see that she's just like Trump. Like he's got his hate, you got yours, uh, she's got hers, we all got our own, you know, we look at someone, we just like, ooh, you rubbed me the yeah. wrong way. I don't know if I like your gait or your game, <laughs> whatever, you know. Uh, so I think he's been kind of a blessing, even though, you know, he, he's he's not making a whole lot of friends out there. Uh, uh, a what, blessing in the way you wouldn't expect, I'd say. Yeah. And... Uh, and it's about time the the polit political s pendulum swung back to the right a little bit. But my biggest thing is s free speech, and it seems like the left just doesn't want to talk about it. And we've got we've got tons of conversations, man. We need to have a really important uh, uh, conversation about to the religion of Islam. Do we not? I mean, Christians aren't going yeah. around bombing, you know. Well, and I, I fear that this is retaliation. This this. This has been going on a long time, burning of uh, Christian churches down. But this idea that, you know, something went down across, halfway across the world, and next thing you know, there's an organized strike on on Christians. I don't know if that's retaliation. I, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to be the conspiracy theorist, but that cathedral burning down in Holy Week was just too weird. And, and, and even weirder that they ruled out arson, uh, what, two days after I mean, this should take weeks to figure out how the fire started. But. Yeah, I don't, I don't have the full like. I, I know it burned down, but I don't have the full like. What exactly happened to the church? Not entirely. I mean, mm. I did know that they ruled out arson, but I don't know if they ruled out anything else. Well, so, yeah. but so yeah, but I mean, you got the bombings in Sri Lanka. Like that was two days ago, wasn't mm. it? Mm -hmm. Where Islamic extremists like killed like 300 Christians on Easter. Oh, yeah, it was on Easter. And then they, and 500 were injured. And then you got Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama tweeting about how it's a sad day for Easter worshipers. Easter, yeah. Like, I don't, I don't you can't worship even call them Christians. Yeah. Yeah. But it's... When you look at his tweet on Christchurch, which happened like a month ago, mm -hmm. and he's like, we need to stand against Islamophobia and white supremacy. But no, when... 300 Christians get killed. It's wow, a sad day for Easter worshipers. I never heard of Easter worshiper in my life. And no one worships Easter. You celebrate it. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. And so what's what do you plan on doing with uh I mean you've got a pretty solid following on Twitter. It's a platform that all of us have, you know, abused and taken advantage of, I think. Uh who knows where that's going to go. Uh what's your future look like as far as activism goes? or politics or whatever. I don't want to call you an activist, but I mean, we're all activists in some sort, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take away the term activist. I mean, I mean, in some ways I could call myself an activist, but mm -hmm. um, basically I, I want to just grow more of a following. I'd love to like, I'd love to go speak for colleges. I would, I'd love for Turning Point USA to notice me because they're more conservative <laughs> and, they they kind of speak for a lot of the same values I have. I feel like if I could get like noticed by Turning Point USA, maybe I could do some good with them. But mainly just to grow the following, I want to maybe start some videos up just of some ideas that I have or like not only against like leftist ideas or not that I'm against them, but just uh, I have some things I want to say about the right side of the political side too that I don't feel like is talked about enough, but. I, so I want to start some videos, and uh, yeah, I'd love to just get more well known and do more good. Well, at least what I think is good. Uh, yeah. Talk to college kids. Uh, I mean, high school students too. I mean, you got. I just feel like, like you said, all these teachers that are so leftist and professors. Like, I wanna, I wanna really help my generation. I mean, they're pushed with the left narrative everywhere they go. I'm like, I want them to know there's an alternative. Cool. So you're a big fan of Charlie Kirk, then, Candace Owens. Um, I do like them. I I don't know if I call myself a big fan, but I do like them. I like Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk. Yeah, Charlie Kirk is stand-up guy, and I, I love his young, objective. Obviously, he's conservatively slanted, but uh, the conservatives seem to be speaking to me more than the liberals are these days. Even in my own country up here, with Justin Trudeau, which is a complete joke. And uh, the hate speech laws, uh, the loss of yeah. liberties that we've seen here, you know, I was afraid that that was headed towards you guys after 9-11. Uh, 
uh, I predicted a couple things. One, that we would go back to our gardens and churches and family parties a little bit more because we realized what was important to us after that uh, attack and that uh, there would be a huge loss of rights and freedoms and liberties in the states. And we certainly saw that. I'm not sure how well it's enforced or how many people are actually being you know, uh, harassed with those laws. But man, in the name of terrorism, of one act, uh, it just seemed like a, a massive overreaction when they started bringing in these, you know, all, all of it, you know, it, it seemed like Sounds an overreaction. Like it was the wrong version. reaction, too. <laughs> well, yeah, especially for a nation that has stood on uh, on liberty for so long. And, and this is why it's, you know, so important freedom of speech, because you know, I talked about the Islam question, we've got a Middle East question, we've got certainly a moral question about abortion in Canada. We don't even have an abortion law. You can go in and get one anytime you want. Uh, the, and the only reason it's hit the radar again, I think they were a little concerned that when Trump came in, that was going to be his his position. He was pro-choice at one time. Talk about a flip-flop. But uh, uh, this idea that we can't talk about these issues or that, uh, uh, um, you know, a different opinion or a different take on the argument makes you like, if I'm pro-life, I hate women. What? You know, like, yeah, it's that's just, absurd. If, if we can't, and I love your passion about continuing the dialogue and reducing the level of vitriol. And as you put it, hate, yet yeah, there is some of that present. Uh, if we can't talk about these very important issues, like we've been papering this over for a long time, man. This terrorism has been worldwide for a long time coming from the religion of Islam. And, well, I guess you can say the Christians committed their own crimes in their own time over the millennia. But we need to have a conversation about all of this. And we can't end it with, oh, you have a penis, so your opinion, your opinion doesn't matter. Or you're not black. Mm -hmm. You can't speak to these issues. Man, when it comes to moral issues, you can have a take. I don't care what color your skin is. It should be... If it's a well-educated take, then it should be valid and heard. Yeah, no one has to be raped to understand that rape is a terrible, evil thing. <laughs> and I think that goes for a lot of things as well. Like, I hate the, like, on the abortion one, no uterus, no opinion. It's like, okay, this is a very serious topic we're talking about. And you just, like, the pulling out the no uterus, no opinion is just the... Like, I've heard some, like, actual abortion arguments that make you think and, like, actually talk, but that one just gets me. I'm like, look, you, you can't, like, oh, what if the guys were going around saying no penis, no opinion? Like, you know how much hate that would get? Like, come on. Yeah, and I don't it know who, it, be crazy. It, somebody in the, in the broadcast world recently, and I think it was someone I respected, made the argument that, listen, when a woman gets pregnant, that's on her. That's her complete responsibility. No, you know what? Listen, I don't, like, if I get a woman pregnant, that, that is half my doing right there. That's not, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. I don't know how they can just say, you know what? Yeah, pregnancy, it's all on the mother. Uh, well, no, it takes two. There's a responsibility of two. And there's a liability for two afterwards. I mean, you can make the point, no, it's my body and you don't have anything to say about it. But I don't know. I think there's been, uh, wasn't there a court case where uh, a man was granted an injunction to an abortion because he didn't want to want the thing to go through i can't i shouldn't be talking about things i don't know about but i know i i think something like that happened but anyway these yeah. are important conversations the point i'm making is if the left keeps shutting us down by saying your opinion is meaningless because this or that's hate speech or i need a safe space then we're never going to get well, we've got some important issues to deal with here exactly and, you won't get anywhere that's the only way that you're going to ignite some sort of change if everyone just keeps in their own little space of this is what i believe and no one can change my mind and i'm just like i wouldn't i won't say hateful but like i mean partially but like and i'm just so enclosed in my own little bubble of what i believe that i refuse to listen to anything else that comes my way and if you do it's hate speech and i need my safe space and i'm not going to be okay <laughs> like these are big conversations that need to be had in order for anything to go anywhere i need my therapy dog that's it what are, what else uh, what other issues are hot on your lips these days when you're talking to your your young uh, gen z friends what's gen z anyways i get i get mixed up on all these um, it's the generation right after millennials. Okay. And gen so generation Z. When do you have to be born by to be a Gen Zer? 
Um, I'm. Uh, I knew this. I knew it this. was. I knew I'd get something to stump you. I'm pretty sure it wasn't it's that difficult. Three. Okay. All right. I think it's twenty-three. Okay. And so, and what else? What else are you and your uh, your crew talking about these days? What are you engaged in as far as uh, you um, know, hot topics? Well, abortion, which we kind of glossed over a little bit, is definitely a huge one. And like, I know most people know everyone's pro-life abortion argument. Basically, I mean, if you follow anything in the news, really, you can hear a lot about abortion, about pro-lifers and how they suck, basically. <laughs> So, yeah, abortions, I would probably say actually the biggest one because that, like, really? I mean, that's a pretty huge deal. And my, my a big problem I have with it is actually with the pro-lifers because I'm pro-life myself, but a lot of the pro-lifers do irritate me. And it's, it, I don't know where you stand on the abortion spectrum of pro-life, pro-choice, but I saw the movie unplanned which i don't know if you've heard of it right it's this the pro-life movie about abby johnson you know she she's had abortion she was a planned parenthood director she went and actually had to help in on one experienced it and realized oh my gosh this is horrible and i was like an activist for it and i i liked a certain part of the movie where they how they show these planned parenthood workers and they show how they're like how they like justify them working there and they're just like oh we're helping women and then during the movie you see these pro-life protesters just yelling at women going in the in the Planned Parenthood saying you're baby killer you're going to hell stuff like that like horrible things to say to women and like these are pro-life people who I want nothing to do with like yeah we might agree abortion is wrong but you are going about it in all the wrong ways and so i'm glad that they shed a light on that in the movie because there are people like that and in the movie they also like said it was not a good idea which i 100 percent agree like regardless of where you are on the abortion argument these are women in crisis i mean they're in crisis so much that they're going to have an abortion literally what we need to be doing and why so many pro-lifers that i just struggle with when they like not not even in real life on social media like you could like just I want to say hate again, but it can be hateful to an extent where they're, you know, getting mad at them for having an abortion. Like these, a lot of them are uneducated on what abortion is and like you screaming at them or getting frustrated is doing no good, but to, it's probably just helping them decide, wow, these pro-lifers are terrible people. I guess I'm going to go get an abortion. And so I like, we need to be helping these women in our communities, especially like unwanted pregnancies or unplanned pregnancies we need to like go around like how can what can we do to help these women who are genuinely in crisis instead of just condemning them well i think what you, know? you know i think what you're leading to is treating the root causes of that and you mentioned uh you know uh, abstaining is an option it's not all that popular these days we've really uh we've uh you know reduced the importance on you know traditional families uh, mm -hmm. we, we killed God many decades ago. I think we're still paying the price for that type of thing. Although, you know, God has a way of coming back in vogue and, and uh, whatnot. But many of these arguments, and I think this goes back to our original conversation, you know, when we look at the left and right, my assertion used to be that the polit political chasm was way wider and deeper than it had ever been. And the people on both sides of the issue were more angry than they've ever been. Uh, I think that applies, you know, I think that I fell for that or I created that as a as an assertion on my part that was uh, maybe incorrect. It's similar to the abortion issue, I think that the people that are in the middle, that we all agree abortion is a horrible thing. We don't wish that on anyone, but like personal responsibility, please, this kind of goes with the narcissism uh, epidemic of the day. Uh, you just pass it off. I'm not responsible. And they treat abortion almost like a form of birth control. Just don't get oh, pregnant yeah, well, in the first exactly place. That's exactly how they treat it. They call it just women's health care, basically. Like, there's a there's a big difference between taking a plan B and having an abortion. Yeah, and, and that's uh, it. And you said to me, you don't know exactly where I fall on the issue. And I used to be a pro, uh, you know, I was pro-choice. Uh, you know, in 1993, I ran my first election for the Green Party. I just fell in line and didn't really question it. And now, 
when you question, okay, well, when is it life? And two, here, here's where I fall on the abortion issue. Here's what I'm, and I'm not completely sure where I fall on it now. Yeah, abortion bad. Can we a lot? Probably not. The you know the horse is out of the barn the, for to use a bad metaphor. Um, I am completely convinced that if you can't figure out if you want the kid in the first two trimesters, that you shouldn't be able to roll into an abortion clinic in the last trimester, it, you know, up to nine months and say, you know, remove this from me and talk about the lack of stigma. I don't want to shame anyone for their sexuality or their choices, but I mean, for crying out loud, we treat smokers with, with more social, uh, uh, negativity than we do, uh, people that, you know, and Crowder the other day showed a video of a, of a woman with a nine month pregnancy that it was in uh, Planned Parenthood and, mm -hmm. you know, against the will of her husband because she already had two kids and she didn't want to go through it. Well, I, why I couldn't you fucking that figure that out? Why couldn't you figure that out in the first six weeks? Like, how are you going to explain a nine month pregnant woman that just isn't pregnant anymore? Oh, well, I mean, I can't imagine you know, how you can live your life after that. And hey, I'm not perfect. I'm just saying that I think that the argument on the abortion, most of us in the middle are looking to the left and right and going, you guys are both idiots. Your extreme arguments are so, um, I don't know, disingenuous. I mean, the, the pro-life, this idea that uh, sorry, uh, the pro-choice, this idea that it's not a baby until it comes out of the womb is, uh, preposter it's preposterous. Is it's ridiculous. Absurd. And then on the other side, you have the pro-lifers that have their own thing that, you know, and I'm not sure about the, the plan B, the morning after pill. Yeah, I get, it doesn't have a heartbeat. It's, it, 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 it might be, I, I believe the conception is life. Absolutely. And this idea that it's my body. Uh, it might be your body, but that is not you in there. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, and they're, so, they're yeah, it's, you. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, and it, the hypocrisy of the left, especially on this issue. I live in, uh, close to Niagara Falls and uh, many know that there's a Marine and a, a Marine park uh, called Marine land in Niagara Falls and the same people that will, uh, protest um, and be an activist for the protection of animals completely have no regard for human life. <laughs> I just think, I mean, we're all hypocrites, yeah. but how can you be more concerned with a dolphin, seal, or whale than you can be? Talk about speaking for, you know, speaking for the voiceless. There's another human being that has a chance to be something on this planet and you don't give a shit about it or you think it should be able to be, that life should be able to be ended. And again, this keeps going back, Preston. Your, I appreciate your time. Your convenience trumps their life, essentially. The fact that, oh, I'm not ready to have a family suddenly is like, oh, okay, well, you, you can die. Like, imagine if people use this for, like, babies just out of the womb, like the same thought process. Like, and even the Virginia governor was, was said that on a podcast. I don't know what he was on, but he was talking about how, oh, well, when the baby is born, if the abortion failed, um, the mother and the physician can talk to each other and see what they want to do. Like, are, what the hell are you talking about? He is talking about infanticide. He's talking about killing the child after it has been born. Yeah, that was that the governor, first wasn't it? Degree murder. Yeah. That is, that is absurd. And he's just saying how it's a women's right. Does mm -hmm. the baby have no rights? Like, mm -hmm. I cannot believe what I was hearing when I heard that interview. I was shocked. And not only when going back to the hop hypocrisy thing, like, it's isn't it like a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine if you kill a bald eagle's egg? <laughs> <laughs> I get where you're going with that, man. It's, uh, yeah. And you know, I, I was, I've been an almost a 10 time green party candidate. Uh, I, I don't identify with the left anymore at all, even though I support some of their policies and I certainly could argue them well, but this idea, you know, the green party in Canada used to say, Oh no, we respect all life. And mm -hmm. we think that women should have the choice of what they do with their body. I, I, like, it's hot. Like, come on, man. You can't have it both ways. And this is, I again, know, Preston, it, it keeps going back to the whole idea that we have many 
important conversations. And this would be, this would be my question. I, I've, I've got Dr. So, uh, Deborah So is going to come on with me over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm really interested in her take. And, and if I could ask Jordan Peterson a question, uh, I'm a big fan of his psychological work and, and, and his social work. Uh, now with the, you know, going on tour and stuff like that. This is the uh -huh. question I, I think is most important to me now. What conversations are we not having or what conversations are we having badly that we need to get better at and we need to have a little bit more tolerance of, and, you know, this is, again, going back to hypocrisy. The left is supposed to be the party uh, and the political spectrum of tolerance, it doesn't seem very tolerant if you can't speak your mind or have a conversation or a debate or because your skin color or your genitalia, your opinion's useless. I mean, you can't, this is the, you just can't have it both ways. That's what I keep coming back to is we have important uh -huh. conversations. And if you keep telling me I can't say that, then we're fucked, basically. Forget the French. Well, the left <laughs> preaches tolerance until you say something that's against, that's against, and like slightly in their ideals. It could be pretty minimal mm. and if you say anything that's wrong to them and then suddenly tolerance is thrown out the window and that's hate speech and you you're a terrible person that hates women apparently <laughs> and you're misogynist and sexist and homophobic and all all of the things you know and uh, that's another thing like all of the like racist you know sexist like all, all the things down the line those words are meaning less and less every single day like when you are going out and calling Ben Shapiro a Nazi, like, yeah. do you know what a Nazi is? And do you know what Ben Shapiro is? Do you think the yarmulke is just a big cover up? Yeah. Like, are you like, how, how dense are you to call Ben Shapiro, like a uh, white supremacist and a Nazi like that? Just that gets me. And like, these words don't mean anything when you throw mm -hmm. them out, whenever someone disagrees with right. you, like, I'm sure there are tons of people if, on the left who could hear this podcast and then would condemn me saying I'm a racist, homophobic, sexist, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like those, those words don't mean anything if you're just going to use them for anyone whom you don't like. Yeah. Not <laughs> Nazis are murderers. I'm not that, you know, it's just like, yeah, there's, there's you know, only like a slight difference between me and the Nazis. Do you know any, <laughs> do you know any passive Nazis, any, any, you know, non-practicing Nazis? No, Nazis are, uh, you know, long gone for the most part and and they were horribly murderous <laughs> people have practiced genocides on whole groups of people not cool and i don't get how if you're you know you disagree with somebody then how you just get labeled a nazi but uh anyways we're, we're getting used to that what's uh what's next for you what do you got coming up what are you going to do to kind of continue your role on on twitter yeah you only got 198 tweets how long you been on twitter for I've been on Twitter. Well, I mean, I have I have like a personal Twitter account where I follow more of people I know from high school and stuff. Which okay. That so I've been on there for a good while, and I've been following politics on there for a long time. But then I decided, hey, I'm gonna make kind of more political centered page, and okay. a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people who follow me on my personal Twitter don't know that that Twitter exists. <laughs> oh, I got you. Okay, and then what's your following like? Your ratio between the personal and the Gen Z. Oh, um, my personal following, like just on my normal Twitter account, is like 60 followers. Oh, okay, cool. All right, so you're quiet so, on that one, and you got uh, a much bigger following over on the Gen Z conservative file. Yeah, my Gen Z conservative is more the one I use now, but I, I set that up in March. Cool, man. Are you got any plans for politics or what? Like, how can you change the world if you don't run for something, get elected somewhere? I mean, I wouldn't rule it out entirely. I don't know if running is the way I'm looking at going. I think more kind of Turning Point USA style, like okay. getting to the community and talking to these people and trying to spread ideas and like just talk, basically. <laughs> it's really what I want to do. I want to talk to people. So you got to wanna... get in front of Charlie Kirk. You got to get his attention. Yeah. If you got it, let me know. Just build up build up the following and I was like, Oh, maybe I should try getting on some podcasts. That'd be cool. And then I saw you and Ashley St. Clair and I, I like Ashley St. Clair for the most part. And I was like, Hey, that's cool. And so I was just like, you know what, why don't I just send him a freaking message? Like <laughs> what is the worst that could happen? And then 
Sure enough, now I'm on the podcast. So hey, that's awesome. <laughs> Gary V would say the same thing, man. Just slide into their DMs. What do you got to lose, man? So I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate your time. And uh, just for everyone on our way out, if you got any final thoughts or contact information, let her rip. Oh, um, yeah. So, <laughs> oh, I'm done um, already? Oh, what? Uh, that's it? Uh, it's over? I got so much more to say. Oh, Oh, that's the end of the interview. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know how long we've been going. I just I've been sitting in my car. Oh, really? Okay, cool. I I, I this could be like twenty minutes, or it could be like fifty. I yeah. honestly like time is just lost for me. I have no clue. But there you go. Where boats are anyways, you right now? Where are you? Where yeah. I am. I drove to Orem yesterday, so I'm in Orem. I'm at my parents' place right now. Okay. So oh shit. Orem is where, for those that don't know? Um, if you know where Salt Lake City is in Utah, it's like just a little bit under Salt Lake City. It's like 30 minutes away from Salt Lake. All righty. All right, brother. It turns out I got an error message on my phone that my data was full. My storage... My storage That's is not full, good. so I want to. Oh man, it only ran. Oh no, it went for 17 minutes. You know, you need a balance. Um, yeah. So, brother, I appreciate your time. Uh, let's pick it up again, and we'll do the same conversation uh, another time because it looks like I had a data issue, and I only got the first 17 minutes, and we've been going for. Oh, you know what? Maybe I've got. The rest of the audio. I might be able to piece this together, but I'm willing to have you back on again anyways. Uh, it was a good conversation. I appreciate your time. So let me just see what I've got here. I think I'm doing a screen capture as well. So yeah, I got 30 minutes there. I got 17 minutes on my phone. I got 45 minutes on my other phone. Uh, hello! Hello! Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's good I'll cut you loose for today brother I do appreciate the time uh, one more time contact information for to find you on Twitter and anywhere else that you're at oh yeah so I'm mainly on Twitter right now at the Gen Z conserve with a V at the end and you can email me also at the, the Gen Z conserve at gmail.com if you'd like to reach out to me for whatever reason or DM me on Twitter I see those too Preston Norris, if you need them, touch them up on Twitter. Preston, I appreciate your time. Keep up the activism, brother. I'm proud of you. And uh, way to go, man. I'm not going to describe you as a 17-year-old because I don't think it's hey, – you're just a guy. And the fact that you're young is pretty cool. But I don't want to be that guy I deal with enough young people that I, I don't start out by saying, hey, he's only 17 years old. No, he's bright. He's got a take. And he just happens to be 17. It's just it's something that you're going to have to learn about the guy. I guess if they go to your Gen Z conservative page, they'll see by your face you're not 50. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Nice tie, by the way. Surprise. Looking well, good, thank brother. Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> All right, man. We'll talk I appreciate soon. I appreciate it. your time. All right. Sounds good. Later, brother. Bye. Preston Norris, if you need him, at the Gen Z Conserve with a V, ends with a V. Touch him up on social media, on Twitter. Kids got some good takes. Proud of him, man. Conser it's tough to be a conservative in the States. YouTube.com slash Jim Fannin. Find us on Facebook, on the Twitter, and the social media. It is called the I... Oh, am I, am I still recording? Instagram. Instagram. We're there, we're there on LinkedIn. Yeah, we're, uh, we're good to go. So touch up the Gen Z. Preston Norris was my guest today. The Gen Z Conserve ends in a V. Peace out, yo. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's my boy right there. See? All right. Yeah, we had a data issue, as you probably heard. Go check out uh, Preston Norris. Okay? Okay, bye.